everybody, welcome back to the exciting conclusion of solving trigonometric equations and inequalities. Boop! We finished up yesterday by solving some inequalities. We did this one by hand because we we're able to figure out where cosine of 2x actually hits the x-axis. And we were very careful about this one when we chose our scale. We went with the common denominator between um, this thing's phase shift and this thing's critical values. This thing's critical values happening at every pi over 2 because, you know, 2 pi cut into fourths. But then we had a phase shift of pi over 3, so we made everything pi over 6s. And we graphed really carefully, and it looked like perfect 2 pi over 3, looked like perfect 5 pi over 3. We double-checked with technology, and it was. That made us happy. Yay. I am a power nerd, and after the video yesterday, I found the intersection points by hand using trig identities. So it is possible to do that question by hand. It was neat for me. And then this one, we moved negative one-third over to one side just because it's easy to do second trace intersect to see where two graphs intersect each other, right? By the way, we could have used, once we knew that the graph looked like this, we could have used cosine inverse here to get the first solution because cosine inverse would have given us one solution. And since it was a negative, and, or excuse me, since it was, um, uh, excuse me, there we go. Since this would have been a negative argument for cosine inverse, we know that its answer would have come from quadrant two, which would have been that one. And then we could have just reflected it to quadrant three to get the other answer. So we could have used the scientific to get these two results, but we didn't. No need to if you don't have to, right? We're just going to be doing some more inequalities. This one's got absolute value bars on it. And yeah, we're not even going to attempt to do this by hand because one fourth is not one of our special triangles. We're not going to get a one over four in any of our special right triangles. So directly to the calculator, So go to y equals, and we got four. The absolute value bars are a math structure. So go into math over to number ABS. So that's where you're going to find absolute value bars. We have tangent of x. Make sure that you close your argument on your tangent. And then minus one. If we're saying less than zero, we want to know where this thing is below the x-axis. I suggest you say that the other equation, other equation is y equals zero. This way we can do second trace intersect to see where the two things intersect one another. It's faster than second trace zero, which is how you would track down where a graph crosses the x-axis. Second trace intersect is faster. So anytime I have to find an x-intercept, I just throw y equals zero on there and use second trace intersect. <clears throat> okay, let's be smart about our window. We know that we're only going from zero to pi. Scooter your window. And go zero to pi. Pi being right there. Okay. The scale really doesn't matter because we're just going to sketch this thing. I don't, so I don't really care about the scale. I'll leave it as ones. Who cares? Whatever. The range for a tangent graph is all real numbers, right? But this is only going to be positive numbers. So, the, what's the smallest value I could get on the left side here? If this is positive numbers, negative 1. Because this could be equal to 0. So, the smallest y value that's even possible here is negative 1. So, just for funsies, I'll go to negative 2. So, I can see the bottom of the graph. And, like I said, it's going to go up forever, so who cares? That should be a pretty good graph. That, that should be enough. I mean, you can go up to higher if you want to, but it doesn't really matter. And there it is. So rough sketch. It graphed four absolute tangent x minus one like this. I mean, it's as ugly as it gets. Oh, goodness. Because it really doesn't matter, all right? 
we want to know where we're less than zero. And, and of course I did this, I graphed my secondary line like that. So less than zero, I need to know where that number is and I need to know where that number is. And that's it. Because the answer is going to be from zero to there and from there to pi. Second trace intersect, which is command five. Second trace five, yes, yes, so enter, enter. Don't worry about that, it's just like an artifact. It, it happens sometimes. And then I'm just gonna scroll over. And I hit enter. Boop, there it is, about 0.245. And we're gonna do the same thing to find the other answer. Second, trace, five, enter, enter, and then hold down the, the right arrow for a little while. It's gonna take a little while, it's gotta go pretty far. And hit enter one last time, 2.897. So we were trying to figure out where we're below zero. So those answers are going to be from and including, because it has a bracket on it, 0 up to 0 0.245. And then from 2.897, no bracket because it doesn't say equal to, up to pi, and again, no bracket. That, that's, that's really it. That's a really easy question. Anything I can help you with about it? Was that one really straightforward? I gave you one of those, I think it was number 12, I think. I think. No, nine, number nine. On um, part three or C or whatever it's called. Whatever. Easy. Ready to move on? All right. Skirt. Word problems. When breathing, a normal cycle takes place about every five seconds. So that's the period length. Velocity of airflow, y, measured in liters per second after x seconds is modeled by this equation. Velocity of airflow is positive when we inhale, negative when we exhale. For one cycle of breathing, we're gonna find an interval of time where this occurs. Time for a rough sketch. This is a positive sine wave. That's a pretty good sine wave. I'm impressed. Just me. Okay. Well, I thought I thought it looked good. My maximum is occurring at 0.6 and my minimum is occurring at negative 0.6. If you care, this is 5 seconds cuz it says one period takes 5 seconds. That's if you care. That would tell us that this is at 2.5. And we're trying to figure out where we're at or above 0 0.3, which is going to be halfway to 0 0.6. That means we need to know that intersection point and that intersection point. Because from this dot to this dot, we are at or above 0 0.3. And since it has an equal to bar, we're going to have brackets on those answers. So I hope it's obvious that it's gonna be bracket this number to bracket this number, right? Okay. Let's figure out where we be. That first equation is 0.6. Oh, make sure you're in rating mode if you're graphing trig. 0.6, oops, 0.6 sine of two pi divided by five. There's no X in this equation times x. There's supposed to be an x in there. Look at that. Goodness. We're going to throw an x in there. You don't put an x in there, it's going to graph a horizontal line. And then, make your y2 0 0.3. And let's think smart, not hard, and go to our window. 
No wonder I had confusion in period two. I just assumed there was an X there. And some people are like, I got a horizontal line. And there's a guy, it just means you didn't type X. <laughs> it's because it's not there. Anyway, let's go to our window. Uh, zero to five feels like a good window. And we might as well just go to say negative one to positive one on the Y axis. That feels good. And graph. There it is. We just need our two intersection points. Second trace five, because that's intersect. Enter, enter, and scroll to the left. Boop. 0.417. Second trace five, enter, enter, scroll to the right. Two point zero eight three. So that is the time interval where breathing is greater than or equal to zero point three. Part B is probably the more important part of the question, and it says to what explain what that means in the context of the scenario. So it's positive, right? So if you go back to the words, it says positive airflow when we inhale. And these Y's are velocity of airflow. So these are the times when we are breathing in at, at least 0.3 liters per second. How about we say inhaling? At least. 0 0.3 liters per second. How do we say at a rate of? At least. Still like that. There. Time when we're inhaling at a rate of at least 0 0.3 liters per second. That sounds like better English. How do you feel about that? That's not bad, is it? Pretty easy? Awesome. I like easy. Can I go to the last question? Okay. And here we be. I want you to know, I have a very, very, very strong suspicion that the AP exam is not going to ask you to do what this question is asking you to do. And in this question, we are going to figure out days of the year. Like anybody in the room know what the 207th day of the year is? Yeah, neither do I. And that's why I say I have a really strong suspicion that they're not going to make you do that on the actual AP exam. So we will solve for X values. And then I'll just go ahead and tell you what day of the year they are. Yeah, see, you'd have to know how many days are in each month and things like that. He says, that's easy. This guy. The number of hours of daylight on campus at Harvard University is given by this equation. It is a positive sine wave that has a phase shift and a vertical shift. It says, find the interval where Harvard University will have no more than 10 hours of daylight within a year. Oh, so this is the number of hours of daylight in a, in a year, and that's why we've got this 365 here. So let's go to y equals, and let's type this in. 3 sine. I'll do alpha y equals stack fraction. We have x minus 79 and plus 12. There. Then we need to pick our window appropriately. We already know that we're looking at one year. So I'm going to go from 0 to 365 on the x-axis. But my y values, I'm shifted up 3 with an, excuse me, up 12 with an amplitude of 3. So I got a maximum of 15 and a minimum of 9. 
So what do you think? Zero to 20? Just so we can see the whole wave. So from zero to 365, we don't want 365 tick marks. So we'll go by 30s. So it's roughly a month. It's roughly a month. Okay. No, it's not a leap year because it says 365. Leap years have 366 days. Yep. And why minimum zero hours of daylight? Why maximum 20 hours of daylight? And hit graph. Looks more like an unshifted negative cosine wave to me. So quick sketch. April has 30 days, yes. So our graph looked something like this. I'm just going to... Like that, okay? It looked something like that. where the maximum was 12 plus three or 15, and the minimum was 12 minus three or nine. And it would appear as though it started relatively at nine, like that. Yeah. Well, if you're going to use I would say that January 1st is, I would say that January 1st is day zero, if it was me. Well, I mean, yeah. Then what's day zero? There has to be a day zero. You're graphing. But there has to be because you're graphing. Well, it's, I know, but when you're graphing, there has to be a, a y-intercept. So what does the zero mean? I say let z I say I say let zero be January one. That way three hundred sixty five is December thirty one. So this is zero and this is three hundred sixty five. I don't know what you're talking about. So anyway, it says we want no more than ten hours of daylight. Well ten is like here, right? Because it goes, there's supposed to be six numbers in between these, right? From So 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So 10 would be here. So it would appear as though we have two places we need to worry about. We're going to have to track down this one and this one. And if we say no more than, that's less than or equal to 10. So we're actually going to be going from 0 to this number, and then from this number to 365, right? On y equals 10, graph. There we go. Second trace intersect. So second trace, five, enter, enter. That way it selects the two and hit enter there. Now we're not going to do partial days. So let's round to the nearest day. That 36.6, that's about 37 days. Well, if January, if you're calling January one day zero, and there's 31 days in January. That makes this February 7th. Let's find that one. Second trace. Five. Enter, enter. So it picks the second, first and second curves. Scroll forever. Enter. If we round that to the nearest whole day, that 303.8 is about 304, which is Halloween. 
Because this is the second time today that I've done this lesson. That's how I know that. Because I'm a savant, that's why. Because that's the second time today I've done this. Alrighty, so the, the interval of time is going to be from January 1 to February 7. And October 31 to December 31. The next question says, find the interval of time when the campus will have more than 14. Well, 14 was way up here. So I'm going to go from here to here for part B. So when I go on my Y equals, I'll change my 10 to a 14. That way I don't have to... Oh, great. I got to wait for it to finish graphing the trig again. Darn it. All right. Second trace intersect. Second trace 5... Enter, enter, scroll. At least these two are close together. I don't have to scroll forever. About 1 to 1.3. So the, I don't know, you want to call that, we need more than 14. So I'm going to have to go up to the next day, 122. Yeah? So call it day 122. Oh, what day of the month is, or what day of the year is that? Uh, May 2nd, May 2nd. And do it again. Second trace, five, enter, enter, scroll. Two, one, nine point one. No. It's May 2nd. Just because of, remember, January 1st is number zero. February will have 28 days. March will have 31. April has 30. January is 31. Except for February. Do July and August both have 31 days? Oh, I didn't know that. No. No, I mean, I know there's a knuckle trick. I just don't know it. I've just, I didn't know that July and August both were 31 days. Really? Yeah. <laughs> There's a knuckle trick. Okay, neat. So anyway, this, if you're rounding to the nearest whole day, is 219. And day 219 of the year will be August 7th. So this is from May 2. To August 7th. And again, the College Board is not going to make you know dates compared to what day of the year it is. Oh, that's the 157th day. Like, they're not going to make you do that. That would be ignorant. Nobody is that big of a nerd. <laughs>